Hello, I'm Tony Hay, co-founder and joint managing director of Responsible Investor. Welcome to this ESG Leaders interview with Tico Snayers, who is managing partner at LGT Capital Partners and also a member of the board of the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, the PRI. Tico has initiated and led LGT Capital Partners um, that ESG efforts since 2002, having steered the firm in deeply embedding ESG principles into the investment processes for its various asset classes. Hello, Tihira, how are you today? Thank you, Tony. I'm doing very well and happy, very happy that you uh, host us in your show. Oh, well, excellent to hear that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to dive straight in. Tico, the opening statement of your ESG report 2021 is very striking. So, quote, as people and planet face even greater challenges, global warming, the COVID-19 pandemic, increasing inequality, ESG efforts are increasingly focusing on real world outcomes, end quote. Um, investment managers are usually all about process. So can you expand on the importance of real world outcomes from your point of view? No, of course, very happy to do that. I think, as I mentioned in the, in, in, in the report, as the magnitude of issues facing people and planet keeps on growing, we have clearly seen governments also react to that. And 2015 was a very important year. We had the conclusion of the Paris Agreement on climate change, but we also had the conclusion of the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda 2030 with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And the achievement of both the Paris Agreement and the SDGs will cost a small fortune, obviously. It will, it's estimated to be around two and a half to three trillion US dollars a year. And in that achievement, there is an important role for governments and for civil society, but there is also a very important role for the private sector. And that means, in the end, also for the world of finance. And the Paris Agreement and the SDGs have therefore also become a framework for the world of finance when it comes to outcome orientation. Because if we go back to 2005, 2006, when the PRI started and when we started talking about ESG, it was only indeed this process orientation that we had. And partly, that's the, partly the reason for that is that there was no global agreement around which outcomes as a society we should try to achieve. And it took until 2015 until we really had this to-do list for the world in form of the SDGs. The SDGs are not an investment framework, as we all know, but it's the closest thing that the world of investment has to truly align the efforts, bring a lot of focus around a set of objectives. And that's really what the, the, the SDGs have brought to the world of finance. But unfortunately, if we look at the progress that we have seen since the conclusion of the SDGs in the Paris Agreement in 2015, I would say it's very much too little too late. So we have not really seen a lot of progress on any of these dimensions. Climate change, in the end, we only saw progress during the pandemic when governments, to a certain extent, uh, closed down certain sectors of the economy, and that then led to a significant reduction of CO2 emissions. But in general, we haven't really seen the progress we had to see. And this then leads me to outcome orientation in form of regulation. And within the PRI, there is a lot of work that has been done on what the PRI calls the inevitable policy response, which is when societies in the end do not react appropriately to these new regulations that basically all of our governments have agreed to, that governments will react very strong with policy intervention and with regulation. And a very clear example is now the regulation that the EU is, 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 has, has launched in their EU Green Deal, where the EU is clearly trying to tilt the economy towards more sustainable companies, towards more sustainable economic activities. And the EU has decided to again do that through the world of finance. Um, the SFDR legislation, the MIFID II legislation, the taxonomy are all focusing towards investment managers and towards investors. And interesting to see that the EU has taken that route of 
impacting the economy through the world of finance rather than through direct industrial policy and directly instructing companies to become more sustainable. So, so clearly there is this very important role in today's world for the world of finance in trying to achieve these real world outcomes aligned with the SDGs. But this is clearly not easy. And I think from our perspective at LGT Capital Partners, we are a manager both in private markets and also in, in listed markets. And we clearly can see a different contribution to these real world outcomes from private versus 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 listed markets. The private markets clearly have a much longer time horizon. Um, in private equity, you typically have at least a three to five year time horizon where you where you own a company and you want to make changes. Private equity or private markets typically also tend to control the security or the investment. There is typically a majority control, a control of the board. So private markets are in the achievement of real world outcomes much better when it comes to fundamentally changing a business or the fundamental creation of, of new business models. That's where private markets are very strong. Public markets, of course, have scale. We're talking about triple digit trillions of dollars. But public markets tend not to have a single shareholder who controls the company. They tend to be much shorter time horizons. So this fundamental change that private markets can bring to a company is much harder in public markets. And public markets obviously have a role to play in making our economy more sustainable, but it is typically more the fine tuning of existing business models, making sure that management takes into account ESG and sustainability in progressing and further growing their business. But we don't expect that the fundamental changes will start within the, the public market. So that's a bit, I'd say, my take on, on the importance of, of real world outcomes in, in today's investment world. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, before we move on, I'm, I'm interested you picking up on the emphasis that you has, for example, on the financial markets rather than companies. Do you think there needs to be more regulation on the companies directly themselves? I do, regula regulation is of course not a very popular topic, especially not EU regulation, especially not in, in the UK where I think you are, Tony. But I think we have a capitalist free market system. And if this capitalist free market system would be good at achieving these broader societal objectives, then we wouldn't be in the mess that we are in today. So I think we've tried, but clearly it hasn't succeeded. So regulation is then, from my perspective, a, a necessary evil to try to embed sustainability more structurally into our economies and tilt the playing field more towards these sustainable economic activities or sustainable companies, which is exactly what the taxonomy is doing. So, so from my perspective, the EU is on the right track. And I think other governments will probably follow broadly a similar track. Um, does that mean that direct industrial policy is not necessary? I would say, let's see where we get to with the implementation through the world of finance. And obviously, if that would not be successful, then I think there is no option um, than to also have much more um, aggressive uh, policy directly regulating what companies can and cannot do. Okay, very good. So, so switching back to that focus on the financial side, um, it's all very well you know, thinking about real world out outcomes, but, but how, how do you track them? You, you, you can implement things, but how, how do you actually track them? Can you cite some real world examples of how, how you do this and how you look at the real world outcomes that you're, you're dealing with? I mean, clearly, real world outcomes are difficult to measure. And there is often an issue around data when it comes to real world outcomes. But before I get to giving you some positive examples, I think what I would like to start off with is 
talking about negative real world outcomes because that's the biggest issue. The world got into these difficulties because there is just too much of, a, of, of, a, of, of negative outcomes that are coming out of our economic activity from our investments and it's also embedded into our current system. If a company produces goods or services and in the process of doing so it creates pollution, the pollution is not charged to the company. The company doesn't really pay for it. So these, these negative externalities are not part of the input factors, are not part of the cost base of a company, but the company in the end takes the profits of delivering the services and the products. So to address that, we need to embed sustainability much stronger into accounting principles and a lot of work is ongoing there but we are unfortunately not yet where we want to be on that front either and we're probably still um, quite some years away of having sustainability fully embedded into accounting principles but that doesn't mean that we cannot measure outcomes we see it clearly in our portfolio um, a simple outcome is for example job creation um, in private equity in private debt a lot of the capital goes to growing companies and growing companies typically means more employment and that's clearly a very important social objective. We also see it with carbon emissions. If we look at our sustainable equity portfolio, that sustainable equity portfolio has significantly lower carbon emissions than if you would, for example, compare it to an MSCI, MSCI World Index. Um, you can see it on, on, on multiple fronts, on diversity and inclusion. We see managers who really, in the private equity world, start taking diversity and inclusion very seriously in the recruiting practices, not only for them as a firm, but also for the large number of, of companies that they own. So um, clear real world outcomes um, are sh starting to show up in our portfolios, and we do also our utmost to measure it. Also here, the SDG framework, I would say, is the best holistic approach to try to capture both positive outcomes on these 17 SDGs, but also the negative outcomes. We see people doing that more qualitatively through a mapping approach where they basically start looking at all the investments they have and start on a, on a more qualitative basis trying to understand which of these investments have a positive impact on which of the SDGs and which of these investments have broadly a more negative impact. That's clearly something that a number of investors are doing. You can also take a more quantitative approach to that. Um, that's something that we are doing, and that is really analyzing the revenue structure of a corporate, looking where those revenues come from, which products and services can we tie them to, and then looking at how do these products and services have either a positive impact on the SDGs or a negative impact on the SDGs. And then obviously you weigh that according to the revenue structure um, a company has and you can build what we would call an SDG footprint, a very nice spider diagram in which you see on which SDGs does the company have a positive impact and also on which SDGs is there a negative score, meaning a, a negative impact. Okay. I think it's worth pointing out to people listening into this that if they go to your ESG report 2021, um, you, you report on this and you show it very visually and very clearly as well, which is worth people taking a look at um, to see what you actually mean by reporting on those and measuring those real world outcomes. So I know LGT Capital Partners sits on both sides of the fence. Um, you're building multi-manager portfolios, you're making direct investments. And of course, you're also managing a substantial endowment for the Prince of Liechtenstein Foundation. Um, I guess that gives you some clarity of sight when it comes to assessing risk and return, because you, you, you can see it from both points of view. But can you talk about how ESG considerations fit with investment outcomes as well as real world outcomes? Oh, very happy to do so. I mean, as we see the world moving more and more in the direction of, of Paris alignment, in the direction of SDG alignment, there is obviously also an impact on consumer preferences. At the same time, as I mentioned before, we see governments trying to put in place policy 
to tilt the playing field towards companies that are more sustainable. So if you combine this shifting consumer preferences with a changing regulatory, regulatory landscape, you clearly see that I mean, yeah, the stars are getting to become more and more aligned for companies that are more sustainable to also have more commercial success and therefore will likely also prove to be more attractive investment opportunities. So we, we, we clearly believe in, in, in a very strong correlation between the sustainability profile of a company and the investment returns that that um, investment is likely going to yield. There is clearly always, have, there has always typically been a belief that the more sustainable companies will carry less of a risk, that those companies are, are less likely to be caught in a big scandal, which would clearly lead to reputational damage and might lead to a consumer backlash. So that belief, I think, has been there since, since, since quite some years with a large number of investors. But what we clearly see today is that not only this risk component, but also the opportunity set that a changing world is bringing to companies that are aligned with these new consumer preferences and with this evolving government regulation, that these companies will also have better chances to increase their revenue, achieve higher profitability, trade at higher multiples, and broadly just be more attractive from a risk-adjusted return perspective. Okay, very good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to say um, again before closing out, it's worth looking at the ESG report 2021. Uh, I would commend it in terms of transparency um, and the detail of information that's given in there. Uh, but for now, um, Tika Snayers, thank you very much indeed for your interview today. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for hosting me. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>